Welcome everyone. Uh, this is uh, it's a great pleasure to have uh, Wei Liu speaking today from Beijing. We have uh, extended our audience much further to the east, and so it's and I welcome to every uh, to uh, all of the, our members from uh, uh, that part of the world. Who are, it's your first time joining us. Uh, Jingwei is going to tell us about topological complexity for quantum information. And uh, we really look forward to hearing this seminar. Thanks, Jingwei, for agreeing to do that. Thank you, Daniel, for the invitation and the kind introduction. And I will talk about topological com complexity for quantum information. And this is a long term project uh, based on the QR language that we studied uh, for a long time. And my collaborator for this work is Arthur Jeffrey, Xun Gao, Yun Xiang Yun, and Sheng Tao Wang, and at Harvard University, and now I'm at Tsinghua University. And also, actually, I talked with several other people, but not mentioned here. I'm sorry for that. Like Kai Feng Bu and uh, Yu Wei Zhao about the relevant project. Uh, the idea is to use some topological idea, and sometimes pictorial, not fully topological and to study quantum information. And in, in this talk, I will emphasize the uh, complexity in quantum information theory. So for complexity, uh, the simplest model is like computing products of matrices. So if we have a bad matrix, and uh, if we want to compute the product of a bad matrix, the complexity can grow as like O to the N cube. However, if the matrix comes from a tensor product, like this tensor power of two by two matrix, then the number of base is actually two to the n, it's exponential. And then computing such tensors, products that all contractions could be exponentially uh, difficult, uh, could take exponential time cost. Well, there are some better ideas in tensor network that you can compute them in a more diagrammatic way or some kind of topological ideas like not theoretical stopping. And then one can compute them in a more efficient way. So this is kind of a point we want to emphasize, like how do we do this computation more efficiently? Well, to do that, we need additional information, not just the basis of the vector space. So in that sense, we need to open the black box in tensor network. We need to understand some internal symmetries or pictorial relations. And here we have a very powerful tool called the QR language. We'll see that later. And to understand such framework like tensor network, and the QR language could be considered as a fractionalization of the tensor network. And then in this way, we can understand some interesting formulas in quantum information or into statistic physics, like OLS formula, young Bax's equation, star triangle equation, kramer warner duality, jordan wigner transformation, and so on. And actually, we can also understand certain critical phenomena in a pictorial way. Well, in this talk, as an application, we will show two well-known families that can be efficiently classically assimilable are the Clifford gates and match gates for circuits or for tensor networks. And they actually correspond to two kinds of topological complexities. And beyond, besides the two families, we can have a mixed structure among them. And that can be even universal. And then we select a good uh, subsets and then introduce a new method to define efficiently classic, uh, classically assimilable tensor networks, as well as some new families of exactly solvable models. Okay, now let's start from the basic concepts. In quantum information, we have qubits and gates. The qubit is simply a vector state in a two-dimensional field space. And the n qubit is a vector state in the n tensor power. And the, a qubit gate is a unitary on this Hilbert space. Well, in general, people may consider the quantum channels or some other things, but in this talk, I will focus on the qubit gates. The idea of quantum simulation was proposed by Manin and 
FEMA and in the Pantis delay in the 1980s. The idea is to simulate a quantum process by local interactions of some particles, like qubits. And then this may be more efficient to do computations for quantum systems comparing to the computation done by classical computer. And in this way, we want to present an n qubit gate as a composition of some smaller ones, like one qubit gate or two qubit gates in small neighborhood, namely adjacent two qubit gates. For example, the famous Strauss algorithm of factorization essentially uses a gate called quantum Fourier transform. It's the discrete Fourier transform on this tensor power, this big space. And it can be decomposed as O n to the cube adjacent two qubit gates and one qubit gates. So in this way, uh, we can write down this complicated matrix in some more elementary ones and in polynomial time. So we can do this by quantum computing in polynomial time, theoretically. Well, exper experimentally, there will be some actual problems. And the, I think so far the best approach is the called quantum supremacy given by Google last year. And they can do efficient quantum simulation of a distribution in the real life. And this distribution cannot be simulated classically in polynomial time. This somehow show the quantum advantage for quantum computers. So of course we want more, we want something more meaningful like Schwarz algorithm or some other interesting distributions. And in this talk, when I say efficient, I always mean in polynomial time. Here are some usual gates we consider in quantum information. Actually, not only quantum information. Uh, the first size is the poly matrices, poly X, Y, Z. And I think we are all familiar with that. And the second interesting site is given by the Hartman matrix and the S gate. Hartman matrix is kind of a Fourier transform. And S gate is kind of Gaussian diagonal matrix. And another gate is a D gate. It's a, it has a, a one and another phase, e to the i, i pi over four. And those are the one qubit gates. And for the two qubit gates, a very important one is the control not gate or the control z gate. Here I write down the control z gate. It's a diagonal matrix, one, 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 minus one. And Kataf showed that I need two qubit gates, namely, uh, SU4, the unit, unitary matrix, a four by four unitary matrix. It's approximately a composition of the above gates with some polyno polynomial number gates. And this, uh, this number depends on the pre uh, precession epsilon. And this is kind of a, a building block for topological quantum computation. This, and actually for those gates, except the T gate, there are pretty conceptual in, uh, in topological uh, phase and matters. And there are some very conceptual way to implement that. But the ticket is a big problem. And there's another approach to find such a kind of generating sites by using the phase transformation. Namely, we can have this e to the i alpha x that's a phase transformation on this basis. And then this kind of phase transformation can be implemented in some other uh, systems, physics system. And then you can write down the unitary gate, single one qubit unitary gate easily using this Euler's formula. So you rotate it by x and then by z and then by x by certain angles. Then you can represent a unitary gate as this product of the three gates. And for those system, the problem is uh, the C0 gate is, or the control Z gate is usually hard to implement. So then somehow we need a good balance between the two. The NQB uh, Clifford uh, polygroup is projectly 
projectively generated by the poly matrices on n qubits. And the Clifford group is the stabilizer group of the poly group. It's generated by those poly x, y, z, h, s, and control z mentioned above. So no T gate. And it's shown by Gottsman in 1995 in his thesis that the, this n qubit Clifford group can be classically simulated by the symplectic group over the field F2. So even though in the original setup, if you look at the n qubit transformation, the matrix is very big, but it's isomorphic to another much smaller matrix, the symplectic group on a two-dimensional two space. And over the field F2, that means the number is just one or zero. So it's like bit, not really qubit. And then the composition of such unitary gates becomes the composition of the elements in the uh, matrices in the symplectic group. And then the complexity of, compu of computing the compositions of Clifford gates reduced from O2 to the 3n to O to the n cube. So from exponential time to polynomial time. So that means uh, if we just use this site, then somehow we won't really see the advantage of quantum computing. This can be simulated classically. So T gate is very important in the setting. And Valent started another interesting family. It's not kind of this quick family like Clifford. It's a continuous family called match gates. So, sorry, Chingwei, before we, just to go back to your previous one, when you represent it in terms of uh, SP2N, you are essentially representing things in terms of quaternions. Presumably that's what's going on here. Is he, I'm just wondering what the subtlety is in, uh, in Gottman's argument. Subtlety? Uh, if we write down those uh, I'm missing something unitary there. matrix in the Clifford group, yes, in it, the original it, basis, it's a very big matrix. Yes, but it's you've built it from quaternions essentially. Yes, and that's very that's natural why, for SP two N. Yes, that's why it could be the computation of those composition could be much simpler, and that was shown by Gossman by emphasizing this uh, this kind of quantum computation sometimes can be simulated efficiently by a classical computer. Okay. And actually, before that, people thought maybe the advantage of quantum computation comes from entanglement. And here, for those gates, since it has like control Z gate, it definitely uses entanglement, but still it doesn't have quantum advantage. So that's kind of significance of his results. Okay. Can you right, defend the field F2? Sorry? Was he, he said it was the zero field one. F2. What is it? C? The field. F2. Oh, F2. F2 is a field. Yeah, what is, is it? How is it defined? It's just zero and one, two elements. Two elements, okay. Yeah. So it's eventually a, like two and by two matrix, and each entry is as a zero or one in the field, in this very small field. And then the computation is just O to the N cube. And there's even a continuous family given by this rotation, E to the I alpha Z for arbitrary angle alpha and another gate two qubit gate, e to the i theta xx, again for arbitrary angle theta. So we can have two continuous family of gates, and then we can post them on n qubits. And still it's shown by Valiant that those gates are called match gates. The composition of such match gates can be simulated classically in efficient time. So this is no longer discrete, but still it can be simulated efficiently. And if you read on the matrix, it has a very good form. Like the first one is just diagonal, and the second one has this kind of uh, interesting form. Like two lines. 
And this is another very big family of gates that can be simulated classically in polynomial time. And the two families, first the Cl Cl Clifford, the second one is match gate. These are the major two families that can be classically simulated. And another interesting question is the 2D IZ model. And here we are considering this on square lattice and we can impose per periodic boundary condition, but that's not necessary. And for simplicity, we consider this as a model with no magnetic field. And then that means at each site, we, uh, sorry, at each vertex in the lattice, we assign a spin, sigma i. And then at each edge, we have an interaction between the two spins. And Hamiltonian is given by this sum. And the interaction J is, the, is a matrix that we can, uh, de de depends on the, the, strength, uh, the force of the interaction. And the partition function is the sum of e to the minus beta h. And on Sack, in his famous work, he computed the partition function of this IZ model for large scale limit as an integration formula. And there are some other ways to compute the partition function efficiently. And some key idea are like using Majorana Fermi's instead of Scubis, or using Fafi's, or using the Young equation and transfer matrix. And the, this, the partition function of the IZ model can actually be presented as a tensor network. And it looks like the square lattice. And at each edge, we have a red bullet represents the interaction, J. So this red bullet is a tensor, like A times 0, 0 plus 1, 1, and B times 0, 1 plus 1, 0. Since the interaction only depends on the two spins, that they are the same or not, the value looks like this. And at each vertex, it, it rep represents another tensor called the identity tensor. It's zero, 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 zero plus one, 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 one. And that's corresponding to the choice of the spin at this vertex. And then in the partition function, this big sum is replaced by the value of this tensor network. And when we join like the foreign vertex and this red bullet, we glue the boundary and the points that's corresponding to the contractions of tensors. And this is a convention introduced by Penrose. And it's kind of a key idea of the intense network. And then we no longer need the sum, this big sum. So we don't want to compute that state sum, it's too much. We want to compute this single diagram in a more efficient way. There's no sum at all. And then the idea is whether we can somehow manipulate this picture in a good way and then compute that efficiently. And there have been some interesting approach to do that. A very powerful algorithm is given by Fisher, Kastlin, and Templey, FKT algorithm. And that it's actually more than just the Ising model case. It said for any planar graph, not necessarily the square lattice, and whose vertex represents the identity tensor, and whose edge represents this kind of tensor J. And here A, B may depend on edge. So the value could vary. And then the value of this tensor network is the Fafi of certain metrics. And the Fafi is the square root of the determinant. And we know the determinant can be computed efficiently. So in this way, the Fafi can actually be computed efficiently. And this is a very powerful strategy or algorithm to compute the partition function of such planar graphs or such planar tensor networks. And it includes some special case we mentioned, like the match, gate, match gates. It's not obvious, match gates is a special case, but it is. And also the partition function of the IZ model. And another example is.
uh, if the graph has no weight, it, then the value of a and b for this j is given by the special angle pi over three. And if the graph has a weight, then the angle could vary. And Jones uh, introduced the spin model in 1989. It's kind of a fractionalization of the tensor network. In tensor network, we, a k-valent tensor is replaced by a two-k-valent diagram in this spin model. It's kind of, we double the boundary point of, the, uh, of this diagram. So this will enrich the internal pictorial relations. And then this vertex in the original tensor network becomes a region. And here we consider that as a shaded region. So actually we assign the spin to the vertex in the tensor network or the Ising model. Now here we assign the spin in this shaded region. And then what Wong has shown is that the partition function only depend on this square diagram. Since the shaded region is a state sum, and eventually the sum, if we take the big sum, then the value only depends on this diagram, not the region. And then if we switch the shaded the shading from like the shaded one to the unshaded one, and then we obtain a different way to compute the same diagram. But then the meaning becomes different. And that actually is the Kramer-Warner duality. So this is pictorial duality that indicates the Kramer-Warner duality. And in this way, it's very easy to see the critical point. And this actually has some other advantage for the exactly solve a model related to quantum groups, like the young Baxter equation and transform matrix methods. But uh, we are not going to talk about that in this talk. So the induced approach is kind of a, factor, a fractionalization of the touch network and it twice the number of boundary points. But there's another even more refined fractionalization given by Kitaev. He used four Majorana Fermi's to represent a single qubit gate. So for Majorana Fermi's, we have this uh, operator gamma i and they satisfy this uh, anti commutation relation. And Kataf's math gives that for poly x, you can represent it as a pair of Majorana Fermi's, like i times gamma 1, gamma 4, and as well as for the other poly operators y and z. And the one qubit gates, uh, the one qubit space is given by the angle space of this gradient operator minus gamma 1, 2, 3, 4, and angle value is 1. So this gives if we look at the general space, it has some redundant part. And in this way, we can take a restriction such that the operator is acting on the rest space. And in this way, in general, if we want like n qubit gates, we need to pair the following Majorana Fermi's, uh, group the following Majorana Fermi's four by four. And this kind of idea has been extensively studied as the Majorana zero mode. And here, I would recommend a very beautiful survey paper given by Simon Friedman and Mayak in 2015. And recently, in joint work with Arthur Jeffy and Alex Wozniakowski, we introduced the QR language. It's a three QR language for quantum information. And we will see this language captures the ideas we mentioned above in a more unified way. And this is a picture we took at ETH. Uh, I think it's at ETH, right? So what's the QR language? Well, here I want to really give you the formal mathematical definition. It could be tedious. And I will tell you how it looks like. So it's kind of idea in topological quantum field theory. We use some 
surface with boundaries called coordinates to represent transformations. And for this surface, it has some holes, like it has two holes on top and two holes at bottom. You can regard the holes as input on top and the output as at the bottom. And you can fill the holes by some other pictures. And for example, here, if the disk that you can fill is a qubit, and then here you have two input holes, two output holes, and then you can consider this as a two qubit transformation. And the rich data is given by the additional diagrams on the surface, like those strings, charge, and braids. We can use those additional topological data to represent different qubit transformations. And in general, this is a map from such kind of coordinates with additional data to transformations on vector spaces. And in particular here, this, this map is projectively. That means for each picture, for each coordinate, it defines a transformation up to a phase. But this is good enough for quantum theory since we are considering action on states and the gates is well defined up to a phase. And for the vectors in the hole, we consider them as the theory on the boundary. And there it's defined in the ordinary science. They are vector space. You can take a linear sum and you cannot ignore the phase. But somehow you can take sum, like the superposition of two states. You are allowed to take sum. And in the box, it's projected. You cannot take sum. Somehow like you cannot take sum of two gates. It's not meaningful. But it's projected defined. So this mathematic model is really well behaved under this physics intuition. And this diagrammatic method is really rich. It has a bunch of diagrammatic relations that we can use. And those relations are very conceptual and very easy to remember. For example, we have those strings on the surface. Even though the surface is two dimensional, but strings has braid. So in principle, you can consider them as diagrams in the three dimensional space, like braids or knots and links. And then those braids can move freely in the 3D space. And equivalent speaking, they verify the random mass moves of type one, two, three. And in addition, we also have those charge. They behave like Mariana the fermions. And the charge can also move freely in the 3D space. And actually, if we really write down the relation carefully here, when we move the charge under the crossing, there's no actual phase. But if we move the charge above the crossing, there is actually another phase minus one. So the, the move is actually not free, but if we consider those relation up to a phase, then they can move for free. And also for the other relations, like for the uh, Mariana Fermi's gamma one, gamma two, if we exchange the order, here, if we exchange the order, gamma one and gamma two, we also get a phase. But here, up to phase is well defined. And all those phases can be captured in a purely topological way by adding some additional data on the website. And this is also used in the Mariana uh, zero mode. And here, the value of circle is called the quantum dimension. And if it has no charge, it's square root of two. If the circle has one charge, then it's zero. Somehow, the number has to be neutral. We cannot have a charged number. And this is kind of rotation of Mariana Fermi. By if we know for, by, for Mariana Fermi, if we rotate it by two pi, the eigenvalue is minus one. And here is kind of a rotation by pi, so the eigenvalue is i. So there are some kind of interesting relations. And here there are some other relations. They are not really topological, but extremely useful. Like this blue one, this blue relation. If you look at this diagram carefully, we are actually switching the order of the two strings in the braid. 
One is a positive breed, the other is a negative breed. And they are different up to pair of charge. And since we can move charge freely in the 3D space, you can consider the computation of charge has some lower complexity. If you compute a very big like link diagram with charge, you can move charge freely. So you can move it to any place you want. And then it won't affect the computation of the link. And here this relation tells you modular the position of charge. You can switch the positive breed to negative breed. And then the big advantage is then the very complicated theory of link becomes unlinked. And yeah. not is always not. Jingwei, in your diagram on the right here that you've certainly written out in gold, uh, you have one charge. But if I had two charges, would I still pick up a sign? If I had two dots and I move one, move it along the diagonal. Uh, if I have two charges, if I put move a charge on the second, then, then the sign is one. Then you don't have additional sign. Okay. And actually, any neutral element, if you move them, it works well. Okay. And since we can switch the positive breed and negative breed, that means for any link diagram with charge, we can move change layer so that is not really linked, it's just uh, some union of circles. And then it's easy to count the value by looking at the quantum dimensions. You just count the parity of charge on circles. If it, one of them is out, then it's zero. Otherwise, it's just uh, some power of square root of two. So it's very easy to compute such values. And there are some actual relations that's not uh, used before, but again, very powerful. And in particular, we need those relations in this talk. The first one is called string genus relation. Since we are having not just the charge of strings in the theory, we also have surface. And if you compose your surface, you may have a genus. Like a torus has a genus, has a whole. And now for this, for example, if I have a torus and the genus is surrounded by a string. Then the relations tell you, you can remove them. And then you will have a sphere. You remove the genus, then you get a sphere. And they also remove this extra string. And this is kind of extra relations. We call that the string genus relation. It will change the shape of the surface. And then some other relations allow you to change the shape of the surface based on neutrality. And I'll skip that. So these are some kind of relations. There's no linear sum. And we consider them as bulk relations since essentially they're relations of tangles of the surface, not the relation of, of states. And we call them bulk relations. And we'll give you some other bulk relations later. And there are some boundary relations for the states, like for qubits. We can write the diagram, we can change the shape of this diagram by taking linear sums. Like we have different ways to connect ball, ball, ball points and they're different up to certain linear relations. And that means for any diagram, no matter how we combine, how we pair them, how we pair the points, we can always change it to another shape as a linear sum. So we can fix the shape as a basis. And then by counting number, it's easy to show if you have two unboundary points, then this vector space spanned by such diagram is actually uh, two to the n minus one dimensional. And in particular, if we have four boundary points, it's two dimensional. And that's the space we use to simulate a single qubit. So you see later when we represent a single qubit, we will use a diagram with four boundary points. And this in your surface, the surface is hemisphere. And there are some special diagrams, a special uh, qubits, like the basis of poly XYZ matrices, the XYZ basis. They can be drawn as poles on the block sphere. And we, you can just look at the algebraic form. It's just zero one or zero plus one, zero minus one. They also consider as plus minus in some notation and y basis, zero plus i one and zero minus i one. And all those spaces has a very good diagrammatic representations. Just uh, we have four boundary points and we have three ways to pair them. And they're exactly the 
three type of faces. And if there's no charge, it corresponding to the vector zero. If it has a charge, a pair of charge, then it corresponding to the vector one. And if we want to represent a one qubit transformation, and then we need this cylinder with the input on top and output at the bottom. And we can fill some actual data inside the cylinder with four, on four strings. If we have through strings, then we do nothing up to S topic. So the, it's the identity map. And we can give a pair of charge. So you can really consider the four strings as the four Majorana operators. If you have a charge, then you have a Majorana, oper Majorana operator gamma. So this is Z equal to gamma one multiplied gamma two. And we put them as a, at a horizontal. And we pair them means we multiply it by scalar i. So in this way, we can represent it, the poly x, y, z as a pair of charges on diagram. And there's another interesting matrix, the Cartman matrix. And in general, it's, it's a Fourier transform. And diagrammatically, it's a 90 degree rotation. And if you project that plane on a plane, it's like this. But the conceptual reading is a 90 degree rotation. And uh, for qubit is special that the Fourier transform squared, Hartman squared is identity. So the periodicity is not two pi by pi. And in general, the, the Fourier transform has periodicity two pi. It's a 90 degree rotation. And uh, if you do that four times, it's just, it's really two pi rotation. And it's the identity map. So this has an additional relation. If you rotate it by 90 degree, degree clockwise or anti-clockwise, they are the same for the qubit case. This is an actual relation, actual relation. And the S gate, this diagonal matrix I1 and I, is simply the breeding on the first two. And then using this relation for the Hadamard, you can represent the gates in a second way. You can identity, for the identity, you can write four charges. And each gate has two different representations. And somehow, why we call it 3D picture language, why not 2D? Uh, sometimes it's very interesting, interesting to represent the 2D pictures in a 3D way. Like recall that we need to pair the four strings in a cylinder. So here we don't draw a cylinder, we use, we use another notation. We write the holes, we write the genus to indicate the shape of the, this cylinder. And this is a 2D picture for the CNOF gate. And if we drop that in the 3D space, it actually has a very good shape. It's kind of, you have two rectangles, and in the middle, they are connected by another legs. It's a very solid shape. So sometimes we can have very good representation in the 3D space, and sometimes the 2D space is convenient. And in that case, we use this convention. We write genus to indicate the shape of the surface. We project the 3D picture to the 2D space. And now we have talked about poly X, Y, Z, the hard modern S gate. And then we also talk about C naught gate. And they actually generate, already generate the Clifford gates. Now, if we not only want just the Clifford gates, but the tensor network, we need one additional map. It's called the identity tensor. It corresponds to the reputation map. For example, uh, we can sign this map 0 to 0, 0, 0, 1 to 1, 1, 1. We have one input on top and three output at the bottom. And output doesn't have to be three qubits. It could be two qubits or n qubits in general. It has this shape in a 3D representation. And once again, we can pr uh, project this diagram in a 2D space. This really, like, we first read it like crossing in the 3D space and then you project that. And then you have four genus aside and this diagrams in the middle. And by reversing the in input to output, you will have a tensor that's exactly the identity tensor, the 0, 0, 0, 0 plus 1, 1, 1. And it has the following diagrammatic representation. 
And recall that distance has been used in the IZ model. So later we will use this diagram for the IZ model. But in general, for the Clifford Tesla network, it's generated by the poly XYZ, the hard model as gate, and the identity tensor. And in our paper, we show that using those bulk relations above, we can simulate efficiently the Clifford Tesla network, Clifford circuit of Tesla network. And actually, we prove something stronger. This uh, bulk relation implies all the test network relations used in ZX calculus. And that's another very powerful computational tool to compute test network. And here, our method are kind of fractionalization of their relations. And most of the algebraic relations becomes topological isotopy in our framework. So you don't need to remember them. They just hold automatically. And uh, for the ZX calculus, uh, for example, you can see the paper of Bogdan and Duken in New Journal of Physics, uh, 2013. Well, here we talk about how to represent Clifford gates using those topological ideas data. But top Clifford gates are not universal as shown by Gaussman. And we know if we take Clifford gates and the phase gates, then they are universal. So the very natural question is whether we can also present those phase gates in a topological way. What, what are the topological features of the phase gates? And this question may be weird at the beginning because here you see there is a continuous parameter. How do you understand some continuous stuff using topological things? It seems no sense. The topological seems more discrete, but this is continuous. Well, the answer is still yes. We will see what we can see for the topological feature of such kind of continuous gates. Well, first, to understand the phase gate, we need this kind of linear combination of the two diagrams. The first is kind of projection on zero, the second is projection on one. And then you can take this linear combination as a phase gate. And you can re represent it in a different way. And then the coefficient goes from e to ch to hyperbolic cosine h, uh, hyperbolic cosine theta. Well, the very interesting relation is the following. For this crossing, it satisfies the following young baxter equation. You have this diagram, like the three crossings, like first, the second, first, and then on the right side is second, first, the second. And they have the parameters. The parameters can be arbitrary angle, sit one, sit two, sit three. And here I want to give you the direct computation to show why this is true. I give you a very conceptual reason why we have this relation. If you not only look at the three strings, but you add one extra free stream on the right, it doesn't affect the commutation. And then you regard this as a one qubit transformation. And then what's, meaning, what's the meaning of this relation? On the left side, the multiplication of the three is the rotation is a phase gate along z, x, z. And this is a way to represent a unitary in Euler's formula. It has this decomposition. And now, of course, we can switch an x z. We still have the Euler formula, so we can represent it in another way. And then this identification coming from the Euler formula corresponding to the young Baxter equation for this crossing. I think there's a typo in your equation there. Is there those minuses should be i's? Or? Oh, right. Thank you. This minus should be i. It's e to the i theta. Thank you. Let's so read it i. So here by looking at those phase, those crossings with parameters, what we have is the young Baxter equation. This is really the topological feature. And from that, you can understand the Euler formula. And not only that, you can also understand the star triangle equation 
in tensor network. So what's that? First, you can write down the star, the triangle vertex, and the, in the middle is the identity tensor. And the red bullet is another tensor. Is this one appeared in the IZ model, this J, the interaction. And then you can replace the left star by the right one, that's a triangle. And again, the vertex is the identity tensor and the bullet is this interaction J. And this is a very, very famous star triangle equation in terms of tensor network. Now, what happens if we draw this in the QR language, if we do the fractionalization, we replace each single string by four strings. And since this one is essentially a sum of identity and poly X, we call it poly X is a pair of charge in, in the second and third line. And then that means to represent this operator J or this red bullet, we only need a crossing with a parameter in the middle of the fourth string. So here for the total four strings, the two offside, the purple ones, are free, no crossings. And in the middle, this black ones, we have a crossing. And then we can represent this star tensor in this diagram, using this diagram here. Now, in the middle, we can apply the young bachs equation mentioned above. Then we change the shape. And then we use the string genus relation. We add a genus and a string in the middle that differ up, up, up to a scalar. We ignore the uh, normalization. Now we have another picture. It has a genus in the middle. It corresponds to the whole here in this, in this tensor network. And the above part is the identity tensor. And then this crossing corresponding to this right tensor. We just reinterpret this diagram. Then we get back to the star triangle equation. And again, it comes from this internal young backs equation of the crossings. Now let's look at the Ising model. As I mentioned, we have two approach. One is given by tensor network to compute the partition function of the Ising model. The other is given by the spin model. And actually the translation is not a functorial translation. You can translate it this wise. But the QR language is the right bridge that allow you to do this translation functorially. First, for everything in the tensor network, there is a direct translation to the QR language. You just replace the identity tensor by like this part. This part is an identity tensor. And the red bullet corresponding to this crossing. And if you draw this picture, you will see as in the previous example, when you write a red bullet, you have a purple string on the boundary. It doesn't involve any crossings. And here it's the same. If you look at the four red bullets, then the string outside forms a circle, go around the genus. And then eventually you end up with the picture. You have those crossings in the middle and then actual strings outside go around the genus. Then apply the string genus relation, you can remove the genus. And then what you end up with is exactly the speed model. And actually this not only works for this translation, this works for many other things. Now here, as we mentioned, the Kramer one duality in the spin model corresponding to exchange the shading. Now in the QR language, it corresponding to exchange the position of the string genus. So that's another topological interpretation of the Kramer one duality. Now how about the match gate? So for match gate, it's again a tensor network of a planar graph. And for each vertex, it's an identity tensor. For each edge, it's this red bullet. And by the same argument, if we write down this tensor network using the QR language, then all the genus will be removed. So what we end up with is a planar diagrams 
with those crossings. So you can consider that as a, like a 3D link diagram, but project that to a 2D space. And then each crossing has a parameter corresponding to the interaction J. So evaluating such match gate tensor network is the same as evaluating such planar diagrams without genus. And this is also considered as free fermions. And the famous, this powerful algorithm given by FKT re, uh, reduced this computation to computing fluffing of certain metrics. Now here, we can give another diagrammatic evaluation called young backs relation and considered in my thesis in 2015. So the idea is for those crossings, if you rotate it, you may go from one, one angle theta to another angle theta. And if you add a cap, so the crossing, it becomes a through string up to scalar. And you know the scalar. And if you compose two crossings, you get another crossing. Somehow you end after angle, add after angle. And then the last one is the young backs equation. So this looks like the red master move of one, two, three, except the red, red master move two. For the braids, if you have two braids, positive or negative one, when you multiply them together, you get two vertical lines. And here you get the crossing. But somehow the algorithm for north and the algorithm for young backs relation are pretty similar. You can reduce those diagram in polynomial time to a scalar. And the key point is that when we do this computation, we never use a linear sum. We just use those bulk relations. So all the computation are combinatorial, and those combinatorial moves only request polynomial steps. And if you use linear sum, it will be a disaster because if at each crossing you use one linear sum once, for example, you, you represent one term as a sum of two terms. But then you have n crossings, then you need two to the n terms in the sum, and that will grow exponentially. So that's why we emphasize the linear, uh, the bulk relations here. It's very crucial when we count the computational complexity. And those relations are additional bulk relations that we can use to do computations. So in this language, what we have is diagrams like planar strings at the lowest complexity, and the values are just circles. And then we can have additional charge on the strings. We can move them freely, and then we have grids. And those are considered as lower complexities. We can compute them one by one easily. And additional to that, we can add the data of surface or genus. And then what we get is the Clifford gates or Clifford tensor network. Or on the other side, we don't have genus. We keep planar graph, but we add crossings with parameters. And then we get match gates. So those are two kind of topological approach. And they, both of them are classically similable. Uh, but if we combine them together, then it's universal. We can represent everything we want, and we know it's sharply hard, and it's universal for quantum computation. And the point is, while well, we can some, find something not in the two families, but also not have everything, something in the middle. And that is possible, and actually we can find many other things like that. And here's one example. It's still on lattice, and between each two genus, you have four strings. So this can be translated to a tensor network directly. It's a tensor network on a square lattice. You can consider this as certain kind of Ising model within interactions. But here, the data is no longer on the cross, is no longer crossing in the middle. It has all the data on the four strings. So this Ising model could work for Interacting for me, not just free for me. And for these models, it looks complicated. And actually, you cannot apply some simple relation to reduce this graph using bulk relation to reduce that directly. However, the result is this partition, its partition function is the sum of two partition functions of free for me. And partition for free for me is well understood. This is sum of two. So how, that, how could that happen? 
we just take one genus here. And for this genus, if we want to remove that, we need to write some local term as the sum of two terms. So that's the cost. But once we remove this genus, then this closed string will kill the next genus. And then it's kind of a chain reaction. All the genus will be killed immediately. And then you end up with a diagram without genus. And what you have is just the, the right part in this picture. And of course, this is pure all the collectors. I just draw a local part. So then it becomes free for me and the Carlsian can have arbitrary data. You can have arbitrary print on Carlsian. And since this partition function is sum of two partition functions that we know, so this model is pretty well, it's exactly solvable. But it's not free for me. Somehow it's partition function is a superposition of two referring models. And actually we can also design highly common lattice or some lattice with more general shape in, in this way. It's pretty fun to design those models just using these topological ideas. And finally, I, I will give an outlook of this kind of uh, applications. The idea of using topology or some pictorial ideas in quantum information. And we have used uh, those ideas to give topological design of communication protocols and constructing quantum error correcting codes and exactly solve models and new simulable tensor networks. And also we hope, and actually we think we can construct, uh, find a quantum circuit compiler to simplify quantum circuits. And also we find polynomial algorithms to solve some common historical problems or graphical problems. In particular, graphical problems are pretty well behaved in this framework. Like we mentioned, this perfect matching problem. It works, we know the result for planar graph, but we, we know it's sharply hard to compute that for non-planar graph. And if we can represent non-planar graph in a good shape, and then rewrite it as a quantum surf circuit, and then that means we can compute it in polynomial time by quantum computer, but not in a classical computer. Then that will provide quantum error results. So that's kind of idea, but we, we don't know how to find such a concrete example yet. And also we want to find those exactly solved models with very concrete physics implementations. And actually, as I mentioned, for the physics implementation of those ideas in quantum information, like Clifford size or in topological quantum computation, or those C not gates in other models, there are always some kind of very difficult problems, experimental problems. And uh, so we really want to know uh, whether we can construct some good models that can be implemented physically. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for uh, an excellent talk and uh, a huge subject. That we, it's open to questions. Okay, may I ask a question? Sure. Please. Uh, so, Ting, we great, great talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, can you clarify what do you mean when you say genus? Because your diagrams look like graphs embedded yeah. into, into the surfaces when you uh, tell about genus. But for a genus of a graph, we have two possible, like there is a minimal genus. It's the minimal genus of the surface such that you can draw a graph. Or it can be a maximal in a way. So what, what do you mean by the genus? Because it looked like that it's a torus. It was because yeah. like, in my opinion, your last, last example was the surface of genus 16. But so can you clarify, please? Okay, for example, here, in the original notation in Kion language, we use the surface. And if you, compo if you compose this, each surface with itself, then you will have a genus in the middle. It's kind of a whole of a torus. As with ah, but it's, a, it's just a torus, right? So because yeah. the genus, right? Genus is actually the number of whole, like saying in topological yeah, class, graph genus theory. Is the number, that the, genus uh, is the number of holes. So somehow here we abuse the words. Here we say genus is actually the whole. 
just one just one kind just of one thing. Hope, yes yes no it just maybe worse like saying having some kind of tr translation because it's like when you say genus one um i was like always thinking that it's maybe there is a surface with with several kind of handles standing sitting in this place but it's still like when you say genus it's like one one handle body uh, when i say genus i mean like the hole in the torus ah okay so you Thank can just say it's a hole maybe that's a better word and the the, the part is, is is very inconvenient to always draw the surface in the paper so we want some simplified notation and then we use the this diagram. Looks like the genus, uh, like the hole, to indicate the shape. Or maybe a handle might be a better word. Yeah, handle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, other questions? Yeah, it's a question of <laughs> logics. Uh, I, mean, I understand that the very interesting thing is about classical and quantum computability. But uh, a more basic question, when you have your, your QM calculus and you have uh, two configurations, uh, is it decidable uh, if one uh, configuration uh, uh, can be transformed in, into another? Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, for the Clifford gates, it's pretty decidable. But for the match gates, I'm not sure yet. I mean, in general, it's much, much harder. I don't think we can work that out in general. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Does it mean that everything was very clear? <laughs> um, I just I, I'm curious to know when I mean the, uh, the Ising model is equally solvable on a triangular lattice with or its dual the honeycomb that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What what is the additional complication here? Because things. Things look very different. Yes, uh, let me see. Maybe I can show you this picture on the honeycomb lattice. Um, it should be in some place. Again, they are representable in terms of Paphians. So all of that goes through. Yeah, the usual stuff. So it, it seems clear that you've got <laughs> that you've got something here. So here the point is, uh, if we don't have genus, it's Paphian, but we can have additional genus. And this so if, if you don't have genus, it's if we don't have genus, then the graph is planar, and then the yes. partition function is fucking. Yes, but the, the the partition function on the triangular or or honeycomb uh, is doesn't matter which matrix it, it is. Once it's triangular, then it's a fucking of certain matrix. Yes. Okay. All right. Good. Yeah. But if we have a genus, then it's not no longer fucking. Okay. And it depends on number of genus. If the number of genus is only logarithm. It doesn't matter. But the example we show here, the number of genus is the same as the number of vertices. So it's really so what, do you mean, what do you mean it doesn't matter? Uh, oh, it because doesn't matter in the, in the large n limit or something? Is that what you mean? For, for the computational complexity, it doesn't matter. Because for each exactly. genus, if you represent it as a linear sum, when you remove the genus, you have two terms. And if you only have logarithm number, then eventually you don't have, you don't, it's still polynomial. Okay. But if it's not logarithm, or it's like if it's linear, that's a big problem. And here the magic is sometimes even though the genus is linear, we have this kind of chain reaction and such that once you kill one genus, you kill all the rest. Okay. And this kind of phenomenon is quite interesting. We saw this may really have some quantum chemistry interpretation. This may be some real model, but uh, we couldn't figure it out yet. Okay. And this is model like uh, on, on the honeycomb. I didn't draw this by ticks, it's right in my hand, so it's kind of a messy graph. But the, the shape here in the middle is kind of a, a hexagon. And still, you have those data, the purple one in the middle, you can have free forming data with arbitrary parameters. And then you have those genus on the lattice. 
And once again, uh, this model is not free framing. But once you remove a genus, uh, this blue genus, then all the rest will be removed. So it's again a sum of two free framing parting functions. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I, I just have a question. What would happen if I added a magnetic field guising? I got some yeah, logical. That's, very, that's a very good question. Uh, it's actually very beautiful in this framework. Um, I didn't mention here. But it is indeed beautiful. Um, Uh, so this part, this, this, this part is the identity tensor. So we actually have put a spin here for the Ising model. And if we have a magnetic field, that means we have an additional operator gamma i for the spin. And that means we will have another genus here with a double string. And here it has a parameter as a crossing. So this diagram gives you the magnetic field and this crossing is the parameter, the, like the force of the field. So it's really like something move around this actual hole. And why you don't see this genus when there's no magnetic field? Because then this double stream is crossing becomes just uh, parallel strings. And then by string genus relation is removed. You don't see it. And can, so you, you can, can you see if, if the model becomes exactly solvable for any special values of the magnetic field? Uh, we are not sure yet. It, it could, it's possible to design some models that can be exactly solvable, but we don't know yet. Actually, I just know this interpretation when I prepare for this talk. I so, thought, well, what's, what's the magnetic field? And that's okay, if we put this double spin around the genus and put an actual crossing, that's exactly the mag magnetic field. So, so does that mean it, you can simulate it very quickly in polynomial yes, yes. time? Oh, no, not in polynomial time. That just means we can draw this picture quickly but we don't know how to reduce this picture to a scalar quickly. Is, is there any meaning just to uh, having a double torus in the, uh, instead of your single handle? If I have a double handle here, I, it, uh, if you have a double handle and nothing in the middle, then you can change that to a single. Yes, handle. but I, I join I join them as a, as a double as a topological two handled object. Yeah. So if there's nothing in the middle, you can remove that. You can remove one handle for free. But if there is something between them, like the number eight figure. Then it's quite complicated. And we don't know how to re somehow reduce that figure. Okay, no, I'm not sure I understand what, what that would mean. Uh, just some diagram if there's nothing in the middle, like uh, if you have this kind of figure. Yes. Then you can just remove one handle for free. Okay. That's kind of a good relation. You can reduce the complex, uh, you can reduce this uh, diagram to a simpler one. Okay. But, but if the diagram goes like this, mm -hmm. or maybe with some other data in the middle, and then we don't know how to remove that easily. The best relation we know is this string genus relation. If there is a string around, genus, uh, around the handle, Handle is actually a really good term. If there is a string around the handle, then we can remove that. But if there's something more complicated around the handle, then we don't know how to deal with that. 
And actually, in many problems, we see this picture. The stubble, stubble stream is crossing around the handle. That appeared many times. And we don't have a good way to deal with that. That actually has a tear. Well, you can see it has magnetic fields. It also appeared in quantum error corrections and many other things. It has other meanings. And that's kind of a really meaningful feature in quantum information. And we cannot remove that for free. Are there other questions? Arthur, did you want to say anything? No, I, I just wondered, Chengwei, if you could make some comments, more quantitative comments about the uh, complexity rather than just polynomial versus. Oh, so exponential. all the complexity here, when I say efficient, they are all O to the N cube. They're actually very precise. Not very higher, very big degree, really just N cube. So is there some good pictorial interpretation of the entropy or some other measure that you can read off from the picture? Um, for entropy, I don't know yet. Uh, for measure, yes, we have good pictures for measures. Um, for entropy, I really don't know. So far, it's, uh, it's kind of analytic properties. What I can say is uh, we can do analysis like entropy and even entropy and certainty principles on the pictures. But the entropy itself is an analytic formula. It has no direct pictorial representation. Very beautiful talk. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Are there any other questions? Paul, do you you're, you always have some comments? Are you still there? Yeah, I think you may have gone. Um, anyone else want to have? Okay, well, if not, let's, uh, let's thank uh, Jingwei again, and um, I will stop the recording. Okay, thank you very much, Jingwei. It's getting late there in, in Beijing. Thank you.